Today, I will be telling you how and how not to store your data when you have a blockchain application. So, as um, every, come on, move. Not neat. Try again. Okay, now it worked. So like, every good TED speaker everywhere that you see, everyone has a personal story that is totally real, absolutely real. Uh, so I have such a real story. And this story basically was in Sofia. So I'm from Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, how many people have been to Bulgaria during December months? All right, all right. You'll know most, uh, part of my story. So me and two friends of mine, we were walking together to the, through the park. I haven't seen these guys like for 15 years. Totally not fictional story. Uh, and one of these guys basically told us, the others, all right, so I am now into this blockchain stuff. And the other one looks at him and says, okay, what is the blockchain stuff? Well, I was expecting a lot of things to be said after this. Can somebody guess what was the answer? Have you guys been asked what is, the blo what is blockchain actually? How many people here have been asked uh, what is blockchain here? Okay, who wants to answer? Who, who has the best answer here? And who, who is the, what's the most common answer that you have heard somebody gives? No one? The, the Bitcoin, right? I was expecting the same thing. Yeah, Robert? Distributed ledger. It's getting fairly accurate. I, I was searching for something that is like more inaccurate, but yeah, I was expecting something like Bitcoin. Like whenever there is blockchain, somebody puts the equal sign and says Bitcoin. This time around, actually uh, happened something quite interesting. And this interesting stuff that happens is the other guy says, well, the blockchain is database. Well, I was not expecting that. Um, I've heard a lot of things. Uh, currencies, I expected Lambos. Uh, I expected people learning, uh, basically earning a lot of stuff but I did not expect it, blockchain is database. And as you might all know, blockchain, it's not a database. And speaking from experience, over the last year, people have asked us to perform database-like actions, like storing X-ray images, 300 megabytes each, multiple images, or storing architectural plans or storing intellectual property that can vary from few megabytes to few gigabytes and even more. And storing actually models of artifacts to be produced. Well, this is not extremely easy. It is not extremely efficient. And it probably shouldn't be done. By this moment, I bet that at least half of you think, OK, who the girls are they? OK, I'm not going to say it. So who is this guy? Well, my name is George Spasov. I am co-founder and blockchain architect in a software uh, agency and development studio called LimeChain. We basically don't deal with cryptocurrencies. We develop blockchain projects. We believe extensively in uh, blockchain technology. So we try to build the stuff that have been already promised. So these are some of the companies that are supporting us, as you can see. In the upper right corner, there is a company that's here, had a booth, Axum. We are very proud to be their partners and to be working together. We're doing like amazing stuff together. So let's get back to uh, why is uh, blockchain not a da database after I told you about me a little bit so that you can trust me just a little bit. Well, a couple of reasons storing data, at least on Ethereum, we are mainly uh, talking about Ethereum, I will be mainly talking about Ethereum here, is basically unfeasible. Well, because it's, first of all, extremely expensive. It would be extremely uh, expensive. Uh, based on a gas price around 50 GUA, which is somewhat of a medium, or at least it was two months ago, uh, if we want to store uh, just a single gigabyte of data, which means three X-ray images, we'll need to spend 
20.8 million dollars if, if ether is six, uh, $650. dollars. And how many of you have a business that can afford to store a gigabyte for 21 million? All right, it's just me, sorry. Uh, second thing that will happen with the network, now the network is, I think, something like uh, 160 gigabytes. Somebody might correct me out of the audience if, if somebody knows better, but it's a fairly big number. Well, imagine that everyone starts putting their X-ray images and their models uh, into the blockchain. What will happen? It will grow bigger and bigger and bigger, and it will actually become both uh, technologically and uh, economically unfeasible for you to run a node. So basically, proof of work will break. And the last thing, well, with the current block size, which is low, it was kilobytes or something like this, you would need a lot of blocks in order to fit all this data. So basically, our conclusions and general conclusions, blockchain is not a database. So how is this solved? Well, we solve it using a system, a system that is fairly similar to blockchain, called interplanetary file system. And interplanetary file system, or IPFS, is basically a peer-to-peer -peer protocol where you have nodes. And all of these nodes sometimes synchronize, sometimes they don't, but they store data. First, they are peer-to-peer, -peer, and second, every node, when it receives data, basically creates a hash, cryptographic hash. How many of you doesn't know what hash means? Everyone knows what hash is, okay? I'm not going to explain this. So it basically creates a cryptographic hash, and if somebody tries to, to change the data, it's going to generate a new one. And the third thing is basically that uh, this hash can be used as a link. So as you can see it here in the bottom, I'm not sure how well is this is you're seeing this, but it basically says gateway.ipfs.io slash IPFS, and you can put your hash there, and then you can access your data. So basically, your link is, uh, your hash is acting as a link. And if you change your data, basically your link is going to change. So an old link is going to lead to the old version of the data. A new link is going to lead to a new version of the data, which basically emulates immutability, something that is a core principle of the blockchain. Um, so, yeah, you can upload your data, retrieve your hash, and then store it in a smart contract. You can store it in a single byte 32. So what this means for us as developers, that we can have the data in IPFS, have a link that is emulating immutability, and still put all of this on the blockchain. So we'll have from a blockchain a link towards IPFS, and we'll know where the data is, and if the data, and we are going to have uh, a link to the correct version of this data. And if we want to change the version of the data, we are bound to do a transaction on the blockchain. So yeah, we're keeping the immutability here. So how to do all of this? Uh, how many of you have actually worked with IPFS? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, five out of 30, it's good, good percentage. So for the rest of the, I'm going to like explain how are things done with IPFS. So in order for you to interact with IPFS, well, you basically need to run a node. Running a node, it's extremely easy. It's like one, two, three, four steps, like very automated. And uh, after you have installed IPFS, you basically run IPFS in it and you have your own node running. It, that's ready to get your file, that, to receive your files, store them, create their hashes, and give the, the hashes back to you. So, I want to show you a little bit of code because this is a development track. Well, how do we create a node? As I said, extremely easy. Uh, you basically create a new instance of, of IPFS. Um, it's, in this example, it's connecting to the default port and default host. But in the IPFS instance, you can put whatever uh, configuration you want there. You can create, connect to remote node. You can uh, connect to local node. Doesn't really matter. And upon ready event, you're basically ready to start working with it. How do you store data? Well, 
It's not really complicated. You basically use the node instance that we previously instantiated, and you say uh, no, instance.files.add, you put the bytes that you want to put, and you're receiving back, back a hash. What you can now do is basically put this hash on the blockchain. And I want to give you an example of uh, how we basically uh, use this. Well, we have a client called uh, Voltitude now. Uh, basically, what we do with them is people are uploading their IP claim, their intellectual property claim, onto the IPFS, and then we are writing into the blockchain that this entry that is basically stored on the IPFS has been written on this date uh, by this person, so you have 100% verifiable proof when and what you have submitted. If you make an update to your IP claim, you would need to upload your new uh, IPFS hash, which makes, uh, basically is going to leave another trace on the blockchain. Basically, blockchain plus IPFS in this case gives us full traceability of everything that is going on. So, yeah, this is already achievable and achieved. Uh, words of caution. Um, IPFS is a new technology, and much like anything actually in our uh, space, in the blockchain space, it's not to be trusted regardless. Um, it's not flawless. IPFS nodes tend to crash dramatically. You don't lose your data, but you lose your connection. And if you are running a serverless DAP, uh, your IPFS node is basically acting as your database, and you can all imagine what happens if your database is down. Although you're not using your data, you're basically not storing new ones, so your service is not working. And in order for this to be prevented, you need to run what? Clusters. I mean, this general concept that how, this is how we normally solve problems with uh, availability of nodes. And there is currently a project for clusters of IPFS nodes. And the cluster of IPFS nodes is a brilliant idea. It's developed by the IPFS people, and it has something very, very unique. At the top of their readme file in their GitHub repo, it says, it's alpha, please do not use in production. So yeah, we are not ready to do this. I can't say that we haven't tried to use this in production, so yeah, really don't use this yet in uh, production. So yeah, this is, uh, this is my words of caution. Um, Another thing that I want to talk about, because database stores data, but data, not all the data is the same. And sometimes your data is something that is very sensitive. And how do you ensure privacy of your data? Uh, I will not claim that I know everything about data privacy. There are people that are like much better in this with me. But I will tell you from experience what we normally do in order to ensure data privacy. And we turn to something that is so deeply ingrained into the blockchain that it's like neat fit. And this is cryptography. We basically encrypt stuff. So as our users already have Ethereum wallets, Ethereum's wallets, by definition, do, uh, do two things. They encrypt and decrypt things. So what we do is we take the data, encrypt it in a way that only the user that is owner of this data can later decrypt it, thus read it. How is this done? By uh, um, asymmetrical encryption, no, by public-private key encryption, actually. So you basically encrypt the data with your public key, with the user's public key, and who can then later decrypt this data? Only the owner of the private key. So if you own your private key, which is the holy grail of wallets, then you're the only one that can decrypt this thing. And let me show you how we achieve this. It's a little bit more of code, but basically it requires um, a library that uh, uses the same elliptic curve functions that are used into the wallets of the uh, Ethereum. So, Encrypting by public key, you basically get the data, do a uh, ETH, SES uh, encryption, you get the encrypted string, you put it in whatever format you want, and then you store it basically on IPFS, get the hash, 
store it on the on the blockchain. Yeah, I'm not. It's getting a little bit confusing, but yeah, basically this is what you do. And when you want to read this data, you basically take the data in whatever format you have it, make it binary, and decrypt it. This way, only the owner of the private key can read this data. So um, another thing from experience, basically we have done what I al already uh, talked about. So medical data is something that is very sensitive. You don't want your medical data to be out there in the world. Uh, you don't want for anyone to know what are your genes, uh, what diseases you might have. It's a sensitive data. So we basically did what I just explained. On a client side, side, we encrypt with the user's wallet the data, store it on the IPFS, and then store it in the smart contract. And whenever you want to access your data, you have only you are the one that can encrypt it. There is a twist though here. What is the medical data good for? For, pay, for practitioners, for doctors. You probably don't make sense of your data, but it's a very important thing for your practitioner. So what we did is basically added an ability, something very similar to uh, view keys. Um, we, whenever we want to share our data with uh, our practitioner, we basically decrypt our data on the client side and encrypt it with the public key of the practitioner, with the doctor, and then store it on the IPFS, give the, the, the doctor a link. So who now can decrypt this data? Only the owner of the private key of the doctor, so basically the doctor. So now the doctor can read this copy of my data. Um, yeah, so basically this is how we achieved some part of medical data on the blockchain, very roughly. And one last thing, it's more of a food for thought based on the um, some conversation I had yesterday and during the last week. When you're trying to store things, think whether you actually even need to store them or whether you only need proof of them. Uh, as I started talking about cryptography, well, we use cryptography for many things, but one of them is basically uh, showing proofs of something that we have. As uh, Pavel was talking about state channels, for example, the cryptography can, can be used for you to just supply a proof that you have something and for a smart contract to verify that you have something. In this way, you don't store the data any, anywhere. You just prove to somebody else that you have the data. There are, of course, concepts like ZK snarks that I cannot go into even if I wanted to because like very high level for me. But yeah, food for thought. Think about whether you actually need to store the data somewhere. And yeah, I, this is basically my portion and I would like to have a discussion with you guys, if you want. Go ahead. No, I haven't tried OrbitDB. I know of OrbitDB, I know of Swarm. At the moment, we are sticking with, uh, we are sticking with IPFS, because we are um, implementing and developing a solution which allows us to have a cluster. It's basically based on IPFS cluster, but we are extending it so it's more and more stable. So at the moment, we have achieved a version uh, where we can safely have a cluster that Yes, a lot of IPFS nodes tend to crash, but all the time we have a demons that they are, they are brought up. And um, for the last, I think, month, we had like one or two occurrences where all the nodes in our cluster were down, and we had like three nodes. I imagine that if we add more nodes there, it would uh, add for much better availability. As I said, the technology is not flawless at all, it's alpha. But yeah, we are sticking with IPFS and clusters. Sorry, I can't hear. Uh, do you find all the 
Uh, yes, we, we plan to open source this uh, or maybe provide this as a service or both, not sure. Any more questions? Nothing? Yeah, Paul. Yes. But so, so say you give the keys to the patient and the doctor, and let's say they uh, lose it. That sensitive data you cannot really erase it from my data, right? Yes, much. So, Can I extend your questions to forgotten, lost slash uh, private key in general? Did everyone heard? Oh, sorry. Did everyone heard the question? Yeah. All right. So, uh, thanks for for asking this. I'll tell you what we do in our basically uh, development. I'll start with this, and I'll tell you that there is only so much that we can do, but we are doing everything that we can. So, first of all, uh, as Robert said, well, every system have a centralized sub part. No, we are not storing private keys anywhere. Uh, what we do is basically uh, we always use the so-called um, um, encrypted uh, wallet, which is basically the uh, UTC JSON file and password. So for two reasons. Uh, the main reason is for user experience. And second is that people tend to be kind of good in knowing their password. So then much better than storing their private keys. Of course, passwords tend to be lost and you still run a problem of uh, having um, rainbow table. So we have some cryptography towards the password uh, based on the real user password. In a centralized database, we store the JSON file, which by itself, as everyone knows, is not a sensitive data. It's not something that can be broken normally. Uh, and whenever the person wants to interact with their wallet, we are serving the, to the client side the um, UTC JSON file, and we are asking for their password. Now, where now the problem lies is what happens when you have a claim for um, a request for reset password. Because, yes, I can reset your password of your centralized account. I cannot reset the password of your um, UTC, uh, UTC JSON file. So whenever we are generating the wallets, we are also supplying them the so-called mnemonics. So we basically ask them very, very hard using very different challenges to store their mnemonic, and if they want to do a reset password, we ask them to basically provide their mnemonic. So we are not fully mitigating the issue, but we have multiple layers of mechanisms for us to provide a way to user to recover their private key that would later be able to encrypt the data. So yeah, this is only so much that we can do, but we are doing all that we can. Thank you for this question. I think Robert had a question. And by the way, this is probably the most efficient and the best way that you can achieve user experience in a DApps. We, yeah, this is basically something that people are used to because even Facebook sometimes asks you for your password. And if you ask you for a password when you are signing something, you're pretty used to this. So yeah, sorry. No. Uh, not at all. This is a big uh, topic of discussion for, for us. And first of all, we as a company, we are not storing the data. Basically, um, 
So we, as a company, we don't, we don't need to be GDPR compliant. Now, as we are representing our clients, uh, depending on what they do with the data, sometimes they need to be GDPR compliant. And do you think Ethereum or IPFS would ever be GDPR compliant or would ever can be GDPR compliant? This is something that I spoke with Paul uh, like on the way coming to here. Uh, this is like a philosophical clash between legislation and the blockchain technology. One is immutable, one is append only, the other is I, will, I, don't, I want you to change and I want you to delete. So what will happen, time will tell, there is a doomsday scenario where um, entities will say, okay, if you're a blockchain-based application, DEP, the APP, you no longer can perform whatever you're doing. And other people say that probably the legislators are going to go around it and say, okay, if you are DAP, then you need to provide X, Y, and Z, or probably encrypt the data, and if the person says, I, don't, I no longer want to, uh, for this data to be, to be there, basically they're in control of their data because it's encrypted by their wallet. So not sure, not sure what, what is going to happen there. I would like not to name names, but you know, people in our community. But you can, you can view, it, view, it, view it from both ways. I'm not sure which one will happen. Because if, if legislator says, OK, and no DAP is ever going to be working, well, it basically means that you need to end, up, end all the blockchain, or at least all the programmable blockchain. One answer about GDPR. So, I think this sold it. Ah, one more question. No, we store them on server side. Yes. Yes, yes. This is the flow. Now, if they lose their password, their JSON file is basically useless because it's only converted to private key if they know their password. And by definition, when you uh, submit a request password, uh, reset password uh, claim, you don't know your password. So basically, it means that this JSON file is now useless. So the only way for us other way than the JSON file and the password to create mnemonic, uh, to create the private key, is the mnemonic. Basically, this is the source for the private key. So yeah, this is our reset password flow. Um, okay, more questions. Wow, I think I lead the leaderboard for questions. Yes. So basically, as you were saying, multiple other parties are going to have part of your key. Yes. But the problem is that you don't want new one. Why? Because only your old private key is going to decrypt your data. So we are searching for a way for you to derive your old private key. So if the multi multiple parties that you trust have a part of your current private key and they combine it together and give it to you, this might work. 
again, we are talking about trust, and I feel he's not good with trust. <laughs> What do you mean giving? Sorry for interrupting. What do you mean giving? No, no, I don't need you to provide it to me. Okay. There is only one thing that is happening server side, and this is me serving you your JSON file, which by design is not a security issue. Mnemonic recovery is done on the client side. So on the client side, you derive the private key. From the private key and the new password, you derive a new JSON file with new password. And I'm sending back to the server the new JSON file that I'm replacing in my database. Nothing sensitive should ever leave, anyone here? Never ever leave something that can lead to your um, private key safely, or and never transmit, should never leave your client, and especially should never be transmitted through internet. No, I, I would never give you my mnemonic. It's even worse than giving you my private key. Yep, any more questions? There. Yes, and I've been thinking all, uh, also about quantum computing, which is basically trying to break all the algorithms. Um, it's a philosophical question, actually. I'm trying to architecture a system that are working with the latest and the best algorithms and the best libraries, like s -Script. I don't feel that I can come up with something that's better than them. So this is why I ended with the food for thought. Think whether you should actually store this data, because if data is not stored, it cannot be broken, it cannot be cheated. So yeah, this is the food for thought. Anyone else? Are we good? I already won the questions award. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. <laughs> and